to introduce our speaker this evening. Um, Bobby Ward is program chairman for, for NARGE, and you can see him about other uh, programs that they're doing. Good. Thanks, Ted. A great turnout tonight. Thank you all for coming. It's so good, good to see a mixture of the Arboretum Park and the Library people. Anyway, our speaker tonight is Dr. John Grimshaw. Uh, he is from England. Uh, John is here traveling on the East Coast, all the way from Raleigh up to Boston, back down to uh, Asheville, as part of the Rock Art Society's International Speakers Program. Uh, he'll be giving eight talks over the next three weeks as he travels up and down the East Coast. <clears throat> well, John is the author of several books, uh, including uh, one book titled The Gardener's Atlas, which is the book on the history of how plants came to our gardens, sort of historical perspective of that. He also has a book on snowdrops, which has been very popular, and it's in reprint now. And his most recent book, which will probably be his legacy unless he writes another book, is uh, New Trees, Recent Introductions uh, to Cultivation, basically going back to the 1970s or so. Uh, John is a graduate of Oxford University in England, where he obtained his doctoral degree studying uh, African forest ecology. He's a member of the Royal Horticulture Society's Advisory Committee on Plant Nomenclature and Plant Taxonomy. He's also on the Society's Woody Plant Committee. Uh, John calls himself a gardening botanist. Uh, he is currently employed at Colvin Park uh, in England. Uh, please welcome Dr. John Grimshaw. Um, <clears throat> good evening. Um, thank you very much for those welcomes. It is a great pleasure to be here again. I think this is the third time I've spoken at the J.C. Rolston Arboretum, which probably makes it the most frequently, place I've spoken at most frequently, which is rather remarkable. <laughs> and, um, um, this lectern has a wonky table. Um, <laughs> don't lean on it. Um, so it's always a pleasure to be here to see this amazing collection and to see it develop and the growing conditions in this part of the world are really quite extraordinary because things I remember seeing as sort of little sticks uh, three years ago are now really rather large trees. So that is quite an amazing thing. It's, it is a pleasure to be here. Well, I'm talking today, uh, well, my title is In a Botanist's Garden. Sometimes I wonder whether that title is really justified. I have a degree in botany, uh, I enjoy looking at plants, but really perhaps it should be in a plantsman's garden. I'm a gardener first and foremost, and my academic interests in botany come second to, to horticultural interests. Anyway, I'm talking about the plants that I grow in my own garden. And I thought I would start really by saying where my... Can we put the lights out, please? And then people can see what we're doing. Thank you. Um, where my botanical and horticultural interests started. And uh, I was very fortunate that my mother, especially, um, is uh, and always has been a very keen enthusiast for British native wildflowers. And I was taken out uh, botanizing in my pram on walks and <laughs> exposed to wildflowers at a very early age. And I think this is the plant I first learned the scientific name of, Bellis perennis, the common daisy. Um, obviously a very good plant for lawns and um, very charming. And so I think a lot of people start in England at least with Bellis perennis, the daisy, as their first plant. And that interest in wildflowers has continued um, all, all my life. Uh, and I try to incorporate wildflowers and native species into the garden, whatever garden I'm working on. I think they're an integral part of the uh, garden scene. Uh, I don't wish to grow only native plants. I was talking to a gentleman earlier and <coughs> saying, actually, we only have 1,300 native species in Britain, so the, the pool is rather limited. I have more species than that in my own garden. So. Uh, but it's nice to have the natives incorporated. And it's also, of course, nice to go out and see native plants. This, is, incidentally, is our native wood anemone, anemone nemorosa, which is particularly abundant in the Cotswolds, the part of Gloucestershire where I live, uh, carpeting the woodlands in, in April especially. And we're lucky at Carlsborn Park, <coughs> where, where I do my professional gardening, 
to have great drifts of these turning whole sort of swathes of uh, the garden white in April, a really lovely sight. The interest in plants, of course, develops and one goes out and seeks rarities. This is um, our native pasque flower, Pulsatilla vulgaris. Um, Pulsatilla, a common garden plant, and uh, as a genus found across the north temperate regions, uh, this is our native species, now extremely rare, confined to uh, about a dozen sites in the country because of, of habitat loss and so on, and um, a really lovely thing to find in the wild. But the other thing my parents did for me was to give me, at the age of about three or four, a little plot to call my own garden. And I think that was a very significant part uh, of my development. The first plants I remember were pansies. They were the first things I consciously grew and planted for myself, and so I've always retained a certain fondness for them. This is a, a, a cultivar called Bilbo Baggins, uh, part of the Hobbit series that we raised, uh, were growing when I was working in Holland for the seed company Sahin, which you'll hear mentioned again later on. And so it was rather a cheerful little one with a, a pretty face. Hmm. Incidentally, the Tolkien family had got an, a, a copyright provisions for every class of object you could think of, except for plants. <laughs> Quite amusing. So, uh, and, and the other thing I remember in that uh, little girl was a, a, a Paul Scarlet double flowered hawthorn. And then another very important influence was the nonsense book of Edward Lear. Does anybody know that? Is that a, an item in the diet of American youth? Uh, it's a fabulous book, complete nonsense by this amazing Victorian artist, he was a superb artist, but had this wonderfully funny streak. And if I may read the, the introduction to the section on botany from the nonsense book. Our readers will be interested in the following communications from our valued and learned contributor, Professor Bosch. I think we all know people called Professor yeah. Bosch, <laughs> whose labors in the fields of botanical science are so well known to all the world. We are happy to be able, through Dr. Bosch's kindness, to present our readers with illustrations of his discoveries. All the new flowers are found in the valley of Very Queer, near the lake of Odgrove, and on the summit of the hill, Awful Tug. <laughs> and there they are, these remarkable cr fantasy creations. Uh, many peoplier upsidownia. Uh, a fat facia stupendia, and polybirdia singularis. This is not unlike a, an Erica from South Africa. Erica serenthoides looks remarkably like Polyperdia singularis. Fabulous creations. And that, I think, has given me a love of oddities and curiosities and, and the wilder shores of, of the plant world. I, I can't show you Polyperdia singularis, but I can show you Gloomy Calyx. This is Gloomy Calyx flanagani, a South African a member of the Scotland AC, um, and you've got to love a plant called Gloomy Calyx. <laughs> uh, it's, it's a little rock garden plant and uh, has a horrible fetid smell about it, but the flowers are really quite pretty. I'm not quite sure how hardy it is for us, we'll find out. And of course the other thing uh, that has developed both from the love of wildflowers and the love of, you know, the hill awful tug and, and uh, the lake of very queer and so on, um, are is a love of going out to the wilds to see plants in their native habitat. And I think many people who are good gardeners or you know, just love to go out and see the plants in their native habitats. That is in South Africa, uh, in, in the Western Cape. Uh, just the most stupendous expanse of annual plants. It's a, all the orange flowers are Gorteria diffusa, a daisy. Um, which actually, funnily enough, turns out to be extremely difficult to grow in, in cultivation. And so one has to go and actually enjoy it en masse in the wild. A third very important influence uh, on my horticultural and botanical development were the writings of E.A. Bowles, the English gardener who lived between 1865 and 1954. And in the public library near where, where I went to school, was a set of that wonderful trilogy, 
my garden in spring, summer and autumn and winter. If you don't know them as plants people, I, I really very strongly recommend them. <coughs> and that series, with his way of explaining the little, pure, little details and curiosities about plants, and giving plants personalities of their own, I think turned me into a plantsman who could appreciate a plant for its own merits, whatever they happen to be. So Bowles was a very important influence in my life. And here he's represented by Bowles's golden grass, Millium infusum aureum, this lovely thing which comes up in spring with this bright, uh, soft yellow flush of growth uh, with our native bluebell, Hyacinthoides non scripta in the background there. And uh, Bowles also was a great authority uh, on bulbous plants. And from his writings, I think I picked up much of my own interest in, in bulbs. He wrote uh, a superb monograph on crocus and culture, a handbook of crocus and culturecum. Uh, here is culturecum glory of three, a really richly coloured form of culturecum speciosum. Uh, in, in homage. And he also, as I said, developed that curios love of curiosities. He, in his garden at Middleton House, had an area he called the Lunatic Asylum. <laughs> <laughs> uh, odd plants that behaved in a somewhat demented fashion. And uh, those curiosities, uh, uh, as I said, are amongst my loves. This is a little fern, uh, the lady fern, Ethereum Felix Femina Caput Medusae. Well, back to odd names, Medusa's head fern. What a nice idea. And it really does just look like a, a little tuft of parsley growing in the garden. Uh, a really handsome plant. That came from the um, garden of Helen Dillon in Ireland. And it's a memory of a of, of, of fun time with her. So I'm happy to grow almost anything that I can get my hands on, including a bindweed. Um, I don't know if the bindweed is such a demon here as it is for us. Oh, good. Um, <laughs> uh, so we, we're on the same sort of level. Well, this is this is actually American, an American species, Calistegia spithamia, uh, from the southeast, I, I believe, or somewhere in the, in the states. And um, a, a nurseryman friend of mine, who also has a curious love of plants, uh, was growing this. I, I baked a plant off him. He said, don't plant it in the open garden, it is a bindweed. Um, so I'm prepared to try all sorts of things. I like most types of plant, but there are limits. <laughs> <laughs> Salvia uh, fulgens in a, uh, a, a selected bedding form. Now I dare say the wild form of this is charming, but when the thing is, looks as if they've been cut out of a mould, and they're all the same, and also a hideous colour, not mass. Um, I, I, I find they have no character, and I'm not terribly keen to have these um, dull bedding plants uh, in, in the garden. So much more interesting things to grow. Well, I should say that I'm very fortunate in actually gardening in three different gardens, which gives me a good deal of scope. This is um, representing Colesbourne Park, which is the Elwes family home uh, and where I, as I say, do my professional gardening as, as head gardener there. Uh, and we're famous for our snowdrop collection. I know some of you here have been there to see the snowdrops. Uh, if you haven't, you're very welcome to visit us in February. Uh, and this is Glanthus S. Arnott, a classic snowdrop cultivar. And it would be my desert island snowdrop if I could choose only one. It's such a good one. Uh, robust, vigorous, handsome, not too complicated, not fussy, and with a delicious scent. So that would be my desert island snowdrop. But uh, Curlsborn Park also has formal borders and so forth. Plenty of space to grow a lot of plants. Uh, I'm also fortunate in that my uh, a, a lot of my plant collection still grows with my parents in their garden. And this is a, one of those, Scadoxus punicius from the coastal dunes of South Africa growing in their conservatory. So, in a way, my plant collections are, are spread over quite a wide area. But I'm actually going to talk mostly tonight about things I grow in my own garden at Colesbourne in Gloucestershire, uh, in the garden of Sycamore Cottage. 
And that's what it looked like uh, when I moved in there um, six years ago. Uh, it had been pretty run down by the previous occupants, and it was just a jungle of coarse weeds and, and uh, grass and so on. Um, it's changed a bit since. And so uh, what I'm going to talk about now is, um, is about this. And I should say I'm not a collector. I don't want to have one of everything uh, available of that genus or so. I, don't, I want to make an attractive garden of plants that attract me and interest me. They must be, have something about them that I like, um, and they must hopefully contribute to the look of the garden through the season. As I said, I've got enough space elsewhere to grow things that are nice enough, but I don't need them in my own small garden. So that's handy. Anyway, we'll move on, and this is going to be a sort of tour of the garden through the seasons. And I must first um, explain a little bit about its layout. This is a picture taken by one of these people who fly over in an aeroplane and take snaps, uh, and then come around and, and knock on the door and sell them to you. <laughs> and the slightly lush green colours, I'm afraid, but uh, it's very handy for showing the, the basic layout of the garden. It's a very small garden, it's not, it, it's not more than uh, a quarter of an acre at the most, uh, a sort of long rectangle. Uh, north is somewhere up here, so we're basically on a north-facing slope. This is actually quite a steep slope down hill here. We're early on the edge, it doesn't show it very well. Uh, and I should say we're at 550 feet or so above sea level in the Cotswold Hills, which are limestone. Uh, pH about 8, quite high alkalinity. And we also have a very short uh, frost-free period, believe it or not. Uh, our last frost this season was the 1st of June, and I wouldn't be surprised wow. to go wow. back at the end of September and find a frost that already occurred. Mm. It is cold um, and dry. The drainage is perfect. So it's an interesting situation to grow things. Mm. I was talking to uh, Cheryl Kearns here, who edits the Magnolia Society Journal, and saying this year we were very lucky because the magnolias actually managed to flower without being frosted. And then the frost got all their new shoots. <laughs> so. That's the sort of conditions we have. So you can't grow all the lush, semi-tropical things I would really like to get my paws on. Um, so north-facing, cold, alkaline, dry. Um, it, the garden has several sections. In this far end is what we call the woodland area. Uh, there are no trees worth mentioning, but it's a woodland area uh, where we grow smaller bulbs and things and, and Trees are developing, but slowly. Uh, there are various borders along the uh, bank here, round the edges of the pond, and now, as you'll see later, we've made a border along this terrace here um, uh, this season. There are two areas, there's a sort of rock garden area, it's a gravel bed, stroke rock garden here, and there's now a new rock garden at the end here. There's borders along here too now. Um, this picture was taken, I think, four years ago, so. Uh, it's a little out of date. And then two areas of lawn. This area we leave as what we call a long grass meadow, and it is allowed to grow from uh, the first snowdrops and crocuses that appear in the spring uh, through till August when we, it gets mowed, and, uh, and then the next set of culture comes and autumn crocuses appear. Uh, and then this area is uh, left in summer as an ordinary lawn for doing whatever you do on lawns, lounging about in some people's <laughs> cases. Um, <clears throat> but in spring, it has um, crocuses in it. So this is a crocus meadow in spring. We then allow the native cowslip, primula veris, to flower. Once the crocuses have died off, we just mow it back and turn it back to a normal lawn. So there's two areas of lawn, and the rest are um, borders of various sorts. So almost everything I'm going to show you now is growing somewhere in this garden plot. It's just a meadow. It's, it's grazed by sheep uh, on occasion. Um, it's just farmland. Yeah, just a field. 
And I think the important thing when you're thinking about laying out a garden is thinking where you're actually going to see the garden from. And a place for me is the front door by the kitchen. And so to look out while the kettle's boiling for my morning tea or something uh, is very nice. And this is a view straight out of the kitchen door in February or perhaps early March with the early spring flowers looking their best. And of course what I want in the garden is a succession of interest throughout the whole season. Uh, there's no excuse for a garden to be dull at any time of year. And so this is early, the cyclamen and comb, the hellebores, daphne and so on, doing their thing in February. And then the other aspect of the garden is to look up the garden path, which runs more or less parallel with the cottage, um, and visitors approaching the house will see it that way. And uh, that's the view up the path in about June, and uh, end of September or so last year, uh, the same sort of view looking at the garden path, showing how it develops with a completely different set of things coming up and being of interest through the season. Well, here to start and work through the season with a few of the plants I grow. Well, hellebores are, of course, a great interest. Um, I know the tilers are here tonight and uh, purveyors of, of great hellebores here. We're not very far away from Ashwood Nursery and uh, John Massey and Philip Bonks, uh, wonderful hellebores there. So I've, over the years, spent a, a rather large sum of money with them, <laughs> acquiring good hellebores in various lovely colours. And these are a selection of greens and yellows from the garden. And sadly, unfortunately, we have a horrible disease in the collection called, um, in the garden called Hellebore Black Death, which does what it says on the tin. Um, they go black and they die. And so the diversity of hellebores has been very greatly reduced by that. It's a, a real killer. Um, do get hellebores only from reputable sources. So hellebores are important. But people think of me as a snowdrop man. Well, I, I sort of do that. Uh, but I do other things as well. And um, so I'm not going to talk too much about snowdrops tonight. This one is Galanthus plicatus ea bowles, named after my great gardening hero, found in his garden a few years ago. This is what we call a poculiform snowdrop. It has no green on the petals at all. They're all the same length. And it's a perfect white glow, really handsome flat. Now, in January this year, a bulb of this, one bulb, sold on eBay for £357. Oh, my God. Uh, the press picked up on this and said that I had sold, oh, no. which wasn't true. And so I got on the front page of the Daily uh, Telegraph, which was one of the major national papers uh, in the country, with a complete falsehood. Um, and nothing to do with me, but it, it did arouse a great deal of interest. And uh, I luckily had been given it a few years previously. Um, but a really lovely snowdrop. And when it becomes available at a more reasonable price, it will become extremely desirable and popular. So that's EA Bowles. And then this one is green tear. And you can see it has this very strong green marking both inside the flower and on the outer segments here. Very desirable sort of snowdrop for the galanthophiles. And then towards the end of February, it may even be in the beginning of March, this sold on eBay, one bulb, 360 pounds. <laughs> so the prices people uh, will pay, the loony collecting fringe um, <laughs> will pay for these rarities is extraordinary but personally I prefer to acquire plants um, and snowdrops especially by the old-fashioned method of exchange which I think is a, a far nicer way of um, acquiring plants than um, <coughs> bidding for them competitively um, if you can avoid it. So that's green tear and there's so two rather nice snowdrops I'm very glad to grow from the kindness of friends. But I like to see snowdrops in conjunction with other plants. Uh, they're lovely on their own, but the winter garden can be so full of colour if you mix it up. So here's a snowdrop called Galatea. It's an old hybrid with lo long pedicels and big flowers, growing with cyclamen and comb and Eranthus hyamalis, the winter aconite. Can you grow winter aconites here? Yes. Good. Um, 
And this is always a, a, a thing. You come here and talk to people, and I don't know necessarily what you can grow. And it's, you know, I'm telling you about my garden. I'm not trying to give you any lessons or, or um, tell you what to do. But this is a pale form of Eranthus called Schwefelglanz. It's a German cultivar. I mean, sulfur shine. And it's a soft, soft yellow form of aconite that is actually really rather attractive. And I think this is an area where there are going to be a great many developments in, in the next few years. There are soft yellows, there are orange ones coming, there are greenish ones, there are doubles, and so forth, which makes a really interesting addition to the, to the spring flora. It's very nice to have these coming in January and February, and the bees just love them for early, early pollen and nectar. So Eranthus is a genus where there, a lot of developments are happening. And I'm very fond of crocuses. Uh, I, I think I'm the original croconut. Um, <laughs> and uh, I like to grow as many of the hardy, easy-growing species as possible. This is a selected form of crocus thomasinianus, again from Bowles' garden, uh, with uh, a lovely dark purple, um, almost red flower. Very attractive. And I mentioned that that part of the lawn uh, is a crocus meadow. When I turned 40 a, a few years ago, my friends contributed to buying me the corns to make a crocus meadow. Mm -hmm. And we just took the turf up off that uh, piece of grass, uh, just skimmed the whole turf off, threw the corns in, and put the turf back down again, with the result that we have this great sheet of crocuses. Mm -hmm. And they are, they're, they're quite cheap to buy wholesale from Holland uh, for us, and so I think several thousand crocuses went into that patch of lawn, and it really is a tremendous sight early in spring. And by burying them under the slabs of turf, it meant there were no little holes poked through the turf for the squirrels and, and uh, mice and whatnot to find them. Uh, usually, if you do that, they just go from one hole to the next, picking them out. But that fooled them, and the result is that they seem to be uh, very well established and, and not being troubled by these vermin. And uh, I should say that the garden <laughs> is also occupied by my uh, bantams. These are silver sea bright bantams. It's a very ancient uh, breed, um, selected about 200 years ago now, uh, for this perfect feathering, white and black or gold and black lacing. Really charming for these, they're, they're tiny bantams, and they are allowed free run of the garden while we're around and I wouldn't have it any other way. There they are coming to help in the, uh, when I was planting the garden, uh, part of the garden this last spring. And they are so tiny that they do very little damage indeed. And any damage they do is far outweighed by the pleasure they give as they are around in the garden. We also have pheasants. Um, this is our Lady Amherst pheasant, Philip the pheasant. Um, who actually lives uh, free range uh, in, in our garden and, and nearby, and comes in for his food, and is a, a wonderful thing to have about. But we also encourage the wildlife and enjoy the wildlife of the garden. I have seen 73 species of birds in or from the garden, which is, is quite a good total. The woodpeckers come for, for the peanuts we hang out, the kingfisher comes for goldfish, and, um, <laughs> and the owl um, hunts in the meadow behind the house. So that's rather nice. And the water you see there behind the owl is the river churn, which flows in the valley at the bottom of that field behind the house. So uh, we're, we're perched up above the river, but there it is always below us. And that, of course, helps with the water bird count. So good diversity of birds, and also other things as well. The hedgehog we have with us, and the great crested newt, um, a highly protected species, illegal to pick up. So um, <laughs> don't uh, report me, please. Um, but anyway, uh, fun to have a, a rare species like that living in the garden pond. Anyway, back to plants. Uh, I've always been very fond of primulas. Uh, this is a, a form of our native primrose called Gia White. It flowers very early and for a very long season. Uh, so it's certainly 
that was well through January and February and into the spring. But I've also acquired uh, a number of clones of the Turkish form of Primula, Primula, Primula bulgaris, called subspecies Sipthorpe, which is pinkish and purplish. And they have gone mad in the garden and self so everywhere, forming this lovely sort of mixture of colours and shades underneath other plants. So they come and do their thing in February and March, and other things go up around them, they disappear, you don't notice them for the rest of the year, and there they are again the following spring, here with a, a Caronodoxa. I think this Sipthorpe is really a, an attractive um, primrose. And typically in Turkey, it, it is this sort of pink and white rather than the yellow that we're familiar with in Western Europe. And I, of course, I like to grow other things alongside it. Have layers of planting so that uh, you know you're not wasting any bit of soil. So here's a cyclum and comb, and behind it are the shoots of Pioneer Mary. I think it's nice to think of your winter garden as the transition from winter to spring. And the new shoots of plants really make a big contribution. I actually think that this peony, which is a Chinese species, is one of those things where it's better to travel hopefully than to arrive. And it's <laughs> lovely to see these buds sitting there on the developing shoots, this bronze foliage, for you know, several weeks during February and March. And this species is always in flower with the last of the snowdrops. It's by far the earliest peony that I know of. But the flowers, they're pretty enough, but they are just typical species peony pink. Uh, and go over within the usual species peony three days or, or so. So they're nice, but the buds are nicer. Um, trilliums follow, all, follow along the early, behind the early bulbs. Uh, this is Trillium chloropetalum, one of the west coast species. They do rather better for us than the east coast. Um, species that I think they're more lime tolerant, uh, the Trillium grandiflorum and Cecilia and things will grow with us, but they're slow to multiply, and uh, these grow very much more rapidly and more vigorous, and that's a very handsome pure white form. Two other white flowered bulbous plants on the right is Erythronium hybrid, again, west coast genes here. This one's called Mini Haha. -ha very attractive elegant plant for April. And on the other side is Lilium martigan album, um, a Turk's cap lily, beautiful for dapple shade in the summer. Uh, again, the lilies, you can plant them a bit deeper than other things, and they'll come up through and over them uh, in, in the summer, for, to flower through the summer. So I grow quite a few lilies spearing up through the other woodland plants couple of blue flowered bulbous plants. On, on the right here is a Bellavalia, Bellavalia forniculata, which grows in damp meadows in eastern Turkey, and has this really, this is a genuine colour, this incredible electric blue. Quite remarkable. I don't know any other uh, plant with quite that shade of, of blue. And on the left is a double flowered Camassia called John Treasure, which is um, really lovely. The flowers last a little longer than most Camassia flowers, and so it has a particular value. I've just got the one bulb, and I'm desperately hoping it's going to bulk up, because uh, you need a clump of that, I think, to show off to its best advantage. <laughs> of course, at the minute you've got a clump of that, everybody will be begging a piece. So <clears throat> it may be a while before it gets to a decent size. And then for the alpine gardeners here, um, I do try to grow a number of rock plants. This is Gentiana acaulis, the emblem of the Alpine Garden Society, of course. And uh, it has a reputation of being a difficult plant and not very satisfactory to, um, uh, to flower freely in, in many gardens. This is one I found in an old lady's garden. She died, and I uh, thought I'd go and see what I could rescue. And I found, uh, found, uh, found a with permission, I have to say, um, <laughs> hastily and belatedly. Um, and I noticed that this patch of gentians had many seed pods on it, and it, it must have flowered incredibly well. So I took a, a little bit, and indeed, in my own garden, it, it is flowering reliably and, and very nicely. So a stunning blue colour. And uh, also a rock garden plant, or we grow it in the rock garden conditions, Pulsatilla vulgaris. I mentioned the wild species. This is the uh, 
larger cultivated form in bud. It's one of those plants you just can't stop photographing, whether it's the hairy buds or the mm. flowers. This is a red form. Um, or, or even the fruiting heads. Seed heads are absolutely exquisitely silky haired, um, long, uh, always <coughs> on, the, on, the, on the seeds, and always attractive for much of the spring. Also in that little rock garden area, gravel garden by the pond, is a, a little group of our native bee orchids. Now, there is a rather rapaciously keen snowdrop collector of my acquaintance who is fortunate enough to have bee orchids self-sowing in her garden as a natural population and she shamelessly uses these as bargaining chips <laughs> to extract rare snowdrops. Well, bee orchids have been one of my favourite native plants for as long as I can remember uh, and so I couldn't resist and she got a green tear in exchange. Um, but of course, this is a little ground orchid. It stands maybe eight inches in height, to eight to ten inches in height at full flowering. It's quite small. It grows in chalk grassland as a, as a native plant. Um, but of course, its great thing is that it is adapted for pollination by insects in having a lip that re resembles rather remarkably well the body of a bee. And there are many other species in the genus Ophrys, this is Ophrys opifera, in the Mediterranean, which have a very highly and finely tuned adaptation to pollination by wasps and other bees. And uh, there's this business called pseudocopulation, in which the sex-starved bees come and mount the uh, <coughs> orchid, and uh, in their frenzy, shall we put it, um, <laughs> pick up the pollinia and take them to the next flower. So there's a very interesting pollination system going on in Ophrys. Um, but the bee orchid is actually unique uh, because despite having this remarkable labellum with this furry business looking just like a bee, it is very seldom actually pollinated by an insect. And what happens is that the pollinia in a newly opened flower are held up here. There they are, just seeing a little cavity there. And then the flower opens, uh, it develops a bit, and they hang out on these little cordicles in orchid biology. That's, that's a cordicle, and this is a pollinium, a uh, sort of sack full of pollen. But as you can see, they're swaying about, and the stigmatic surface where they need to land to pollinate is just there. And it doesn't take very long before the wind knocks them into that uh, surface, which is sticky as well, and they self-pollinate. And so, despite all this complicated adaptation for being bombed by an insect, um, <laughs> the wind does it anyway. So, you get the, um, the bee orchid set to seed prodigiously, and when it's common, it is very common indeed, um, because of this. And it also means that if you get uh, a little mutation in the flower, maybe go white or have a funnily shaped lip. Because it's inbred, you can get whole populations of these things because the bees and other insects aren't doing their normal job. So it's a very interesting plant to grow. And I'm just hoping that the result of all this activity will be a nice crop of seedlings in the future. <laughs> well, I built another rock garden earlier in the year. Uh, there it is, it has the statutory modern crevice element in it, and uh, it looks a lot bigger in pictures than it seemed to be. You know, you heave marrow loads of stuff around for a long time, and you think you've done very well, and then you stand back and think it's only knee high. Um, but anyway, it gives me another aspect of the garden. It's very young, only made in May, so not much has really taken off yet, but here's a few pictures from it. On the left is a Monardella macrantha, a Western United States native, lovely scarlet hummingbird pollinated flowers with a semper vivum. On the top right, oh sorry, top right is a little semper vivum globulibra. This has an interesting history. This uh, is the same clone that Carl Linnaeus grew at his home in Sweden in the 18th century and has been grown there ever since and is now given out by the um, authorities there to people of distinction as a present, a 
friend of mine has a, a connection with the Swedish uh, botanists and was given a plant of this and it came, a little bit came my way. So it's rather fun to have a plant that was grown by the great Linnaeus uh, 250 years ago, uh, living history. You can't propagate antiques, but you can propagate antique plants, and that's nice. And just to continue here is Androsace sempervivoides, the sempervivum-like uh, Androsace from the Himalaya, waiting to see its pink flowers next spring. Bulbous plants, I uh, uh, mentioned, are an interest, and one group I like are the fritillarias. This is fritillaria grica, a slightly frog-colored uh, flower with a horrible smell, but quite attractive in its way. And uh, here's Fritillaria pyrenaica from the meadows of the Pyrenees, which is easier to grow and will form a nice clump of these brown uh, flowers with a sort of slightly golden interior. Again, a horrible stink, but <laughs> attractive and easy to grow. If you like muscaris, grape hyacinths, that one is in the background is one I recommend. It's called Safia, S-A-F-F-I-E-R. And it's, it never opens the flowers. Uh, they're completely closed, they have these little green tips, which has the result of never being pollinated. So they never set seed, so they don't go weedy all over the place, uh, which is, I think, a rather useful advantage. We're lucky uh, to have, not far from where we live, a population of the European native Fritillaria meliagris. And it is in Thames Valley, lowland meadows, a terribly rare habitat now because of course the lush meadowland was mostly ploughed up long ago. And this was common land, it's never been under the plough. And there are just millions of Fritillaria meliagris growing there in the, in the meadow. So that's the site of North Meadow, Crick Lane in April. And of course one has to have native Fritillaria meliagris in the garden as well, mm -hmm. the white form here. That's in what we call the Long Meadow, as are uh, marsh orchids. This is Dactylariza, uh, the Dactylariza hybrid growing in the grass there. Always fun to try these things and push them. Try to make your garden habitats suitable for growing the rarer things as well as the more common ones. There is the, um, the long meadow area. Here there's the pond and the rock garden areas. So looking across in June, I'm not a purist. It's not meant to be a native meadow. It has all sorts of things. Uh, the yellow plant here is yellow rattle, Rhinanthus minor, which is a heavy parasitic plant. Uh, it plugs into the roots of grasses and so on and, and gets great of its nutrients from them. Very useful for suppressing the vigor of, of grasses. But you can also see poppies, Popalba bracteatum in this case, growing in the meadow, and there are many other things. And I find this meadow area quite one of the most interesting and pleasant areas of the garden. It gives me well, as much pleasure as any other area through the season. One of the plants I love to grow there is Iris latifolia, again a plant of Pyrenean meadows. Um, big blue flowers. I think it's coming out a wee bit too blue. Um, it's a slightly softer shade than that. Great plant. Comes up through the spring, long leaves which are buried amongst the growing grasses, flowers in June, and then uh, is ready, the seeds are ready to scatter before you mow it in August. Lovely plant to have. And uh, I like to have them the sort of continuity from the meadow area in the front with the irises and geranium pretensia, our native cranes built, a strantia major it's on in the grass. Then there's just a little narrow mown path between that and the border behind. And I like to see them sort of melding together in a swathe and not trying to make a distinction between wild and garden too much. That's nice. So uh, cultivated geraniums, euphorbias, and in the background is Delphinium elatum, which is the original species from which the big garden delphiniums were derived. Very elegant species, quite robust, it doesn't, it's not too heavy, it doesn't blow over, which the larger cultivars do, and, and jolly good blue colours. And in front of it is Aruncus Horatio. Aruncus biocus is quite a commonly grown garden plant, this is a cultivar selected in Germany some time ago and has these lovely horizontal flowering shoots off the stem. A very 
unusual shape of inflorescence, and the combination is, is rather good. Uh, this is a carrot. Mm. Ordinary Dorcas carota, they cultivate a carrot. But in the farmers' markets, you can buy, in England at least, purple carrots as a novelty. You can get white ones and yellow ones and ordinary orange ones, but you can also get purple ones. And I thought to myself, seeing a bundle of these things for sale, ah, oh, there's an awful lot of pink pigment in there. I wonder what the flowers look like. <laughs> and so I bought a few, we ate some, and I planted the others just like a bulb, which of course they are. They are an overwintering storage organ. And this was the result. It's a very lovely, soft pink, umbellifer, uh, umbelliferous flower in the following June or so. Actually, rather large in October, the place, but rather fun. And you can grow these for yourself and uh, eat some. You plant a few in the garden. Uh, and if you don't have too many rabbits, the result will be rather attractive. And I'm never against using annuals in the garden. I find, well, certainly the English gardeners tend to regard them as a bit infra dig, just a nuisance, and you know, who wants to grow annuals? And yet, they add such a great deal to the garden. This is the white form of Papava somniferum, the opium poppy, just sown in the border this, um, this spring and doing its thing and flowering beautifully. This, uh, the seed for this came from uh, Pam Schwert and Sybil Kreutzberger, who were the head gardeners at Sissinghurst Castle for many years, for 30 years. They started work with Vita Sackville West. And I admired it in their retirement garden in Gloucestershire. And, uh, they gave me a pinch of seed. And when I saw Sybil Kreutzberger, Hammond's unfortunately has died now, uh, a few weeks ago, and I said, had this white poppy grown in the white garden at Sissinghurst? Yes, it had. But it hadn't always been there. And the two ladies had seen, had fancied the idea of white poppies in this garden. And they put their heads together and thought, where could they get white poppies from? And they'd seen pictures of good white poppies in Afghanistan. <laughs> <laughs> so they instituted a search, and, and I don't know quite how they arranged it, but they were hunting poppy seed from Afghanistan. <laughs> and they traced it down to the local bakery, because uh, bakers put poppy seed on bread. <coughs> and so this is bakery poppy seed. <laughs> and, uh, it's a very interesting tale or plant hunting, thinking outside the box. You don't actually have to go outside your front uh, door necessarily to acquire interesting plants. Anyway, I always have liked to go outside the front door to collect interesting plants. And as Bobby said, I have spent quite a lot of time in Africa over the years, especially working on Kilimanjaro in Tanzania, uh, Africa's highest mountain. And I lived there in the forest for three and a half years on various ecological uh, research projects. And during that time, I got very interested in the native species of impatiens. Everybody's familiar with impatiens wallariana, the busy lizzy, which is also a, an East African native. It comes from Kenya and Tanzania in its original format. And this is impatiens kilimanjaro. This is an endemic species to the mountain and has this wonderful scarlet and gold flower really handsomely. It's a tender plant. You have to take cuttings every year and keep them under glass, but fun to grow in the garden, at least in our conditions. I fear in this area with heat and humidity it would melt very rapidly. Uh, those East African mountains are rather cool. Uh, certainly nothing like the temperatures you get here. But we can grow it, and it is a lovely reminder of a time there. Another one, uh, this is from a Kenyan mountain, is in Paget's Hermeli, big pink butterflies. This one is in cultivation in the States with the cultivar name, I'm sorry to say, Grimshaw. Um, and you can buy that from Annie's Annuals, California, I understand. That's some fancy price, but it's a very attractive plant for cooler uh, conditions. And there are two, a couple of large perennial species of Paget's that I'm fond of. This is Tinctoria, which can be a huge bush, sort of, I've seen it 10 or 12 feet in height in the wild, in, in gardens maybe five or six, and especially in the autumn months, it's covered in these huge white flowers hanging above the flower like 
of plant like butterflies and with a lovely sweet scent. Mm -hmm. And that is hardy because it has big tubers like a dahlia, mm -hmm. uh, which if you mulch them or in what we used to regard as a decent English winter, uh, were perfectly hardy in the ground. Unfortunately, mm -hmm. our English winters are no more. Um, so this is a more or less hardy tropical African busy lizzy. And so is this one, Gumpatian's rothi, which I introduced from Ethiopia about 10 years ago. And this does also, it's a rel relative of Tinctoria, also produces big tuberous roots. And this has been reliably hardy in my garden with all that uh, you know, cold weather and so on for um, the past several years. Uh, an interesting hardy African plant. Well, as I said, I'm very fond of many African species. This is a gladiolus growing high on Mount Kenya in the moorland alpine zone of the high African mountains. Gladiolus watsonioides, really gorgeous scarlet gladiolus. This I do grow in a pot and it flowers really reasonably reliably and um, is, a, is a memory of those mountains but uh, sadly too tender for growing outside. And on the left is a little eucomis, the dumpiest and least attractive eucomis in existence, <laughs> um, which is named after me. <laughs> so, yeah, another souvenir of, um, of African exploration, this time in, in the Drakensberg Mountains of South Africa. Uh, and uh, just a, one of these chance trips, uh, one of the chance discoveries on an Alpine Garden Society tour, botanizing around and finding a plant that really did not fit any of the descriptions or keys, it was completely you know, unidentifiable, just didn't fit. And so after some years of pestering people, uh, it was recognized as a, as a new species. That's rather exciting. It's wonderful to know that there are new plants to be found out there, new species, without necessarily too much effort. Well, tropical plants, um, we can grow a few by uh, keeping them under glass and so on. And I like to have a, a selection of begonias uh, in a tub outside the, the door. This is at the top, begonia luxuriant with those lovely leaves and a, a cultivar whose name I've forgotten uh, below. One of my great loves is uh, uh, making on photography now, and I love the shape and texture of plants. I'm always trying to bring that out in, in my photographs. As did uh, an, an, a very great inspiration of mine, Karl Blossfeld, who was a German uh, working in the first 1920s, 1930s. He produced a big book called Art Forms in Nature. And this picture of Theopsis donabrata is one of those, showing the symmetry and beauty of plants when you look at them close up and look for those neat arrangements. So I'm always looking for similar attractive shapes in the plants I grow and photograph. In, on the left is Melianthus major, a South African ornamental foliage plant. Is that hardy here by any chance? Anybody? Not reliably. No, it's not reliably hardy with us either, uh, but it is such a handsome foliage plant that one has to grow it in a pot. And looking at details, here's Begonia grandis, <coughs> the, the one called claret jug with this incredibly red pigmentation in the foliage, looking through it towards the sun and showing up those veins. Aricema consanguineum, a close-up showing the pattern within the uh, various leaflets making up the full leaf. And beauty also in more prosaic objects. Here's a, a burial a sort of lettuce, a um, mixed pot of lettuces. I, I like to grow a big tub of them by the back door for re ready reference for the salad bowl uh, in, in the evening. But this is a, a variety developed by friends of mine in Holland. Um, the advantage of it is that it has a very broad meristem, meaning that all the leaves come up from a, a very sort of broad point, and its unique selling point is that you can prepare it for the leaf trade by one single swoop of a knife. I, I, you save about half a second per lettuce, and therefore you make more profit. Um, but it's jolly attractive when you grow it as an ornamental, and it tastes good too. Uh, a combination I have been enjoying this year is this bronze leaf Corydalis, 
whose name has changed Temulifolia, chocolate stars, growing with bowls as golden grass, familiar with Fusum aureum there, making a very attractive foliage combination as the plants came up in March. Uh, here later in the season is a, a, a little foliage combination. So much value in foliage. People so keen on flowers all the time. Um, foliage gives you a lot longer season and so much, as much interest really, gives me as much interest as the flowers at least. Here's a combination of a, a variegated mint, leaves of Aracema candidissima and uh, a, 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 a mahoney colored bark called mosery, which always has this soft yellow flush and pinkish flushes in the foliage. Really handy foliage plant. Arisima uh, candidissimum I mentioned in the previous picture of the big trifoliate leaves. Standard clone form in cultivation with us is this uh, white with a pink flush form. Grows like potatoes, increases incredibly well. Uh, handsome plant, of course. This, on the other hand, on the left, is a, a red form, which came in with an import from Chen Yi, the famous Chinese nurserywoman. And, um, it's, it's quite a distinct colour, but needless to say, of course, it doesn't want to increase. And uh, I'm very keen on arums and aroids in general. I can't grow colocasias and all these luxurious things that I've been enjoying so much today at uh, Plant Delights and just drooling over. We just simply can't grow, we just don't have that heat. But we can grow arums and uh, so a few other hardy genera. This is a selection of Aero Metallicum, which I call best spots, for obvious reasons. Uh, handsome foliage with both white veins and black spots, and these very well-marked spades in May. A big herbaceous plant, introduced by the Wynne Joneses, Bledin and Sue Wynne Jones, who are coming here later in the month for the symposium. This is Rogersia Kruke Cardinal, a very handsome plant with this big inflorescence of, of reddish flowers. Good introduction from them. Variegated plants I like, but in moderation. One can have too many of them too quickly, I think. And they should counterpoint the green, not dominate it. But this is one I'm very fond of. It's a variegated oriental poppy called frosty. It has uh, rosettes of, of leaves through the autumn and winter. They develop in spring. and really make a handsome feature in the border for a long time. Unfortunately, it flowers. And, um, <laughs> <laughs> but again, um, it is, uh, it's a short-lived flowering period, so one doesn't have to worry about it too long. Then I just cut the whole thing off, and um, it starts again. Uh, it would be nicer if they were either a deep red or a paler pink or something, but this orangey red it, it isn't entirely to my taste. So that's frosty. Well, frost, of course, is a feature of our life. And uh, this last winter, we had a, a particularly savage spell. We had five frost-free days in December. And the temperature on Boxing Day, I think 26th of December, uh, went down to what I believe you would call five degrees Fahrenheit, minus 15 Celsius, <coughs> which is the coldest most people in Britain can now remember. And, uh, that was a shock to the system and to many plants. We had a lot of losses. And this is a, a conifer I'm very fond of. It's Camiciparus lawsoniana, the port orphaned cedar from Oregon and California, in a form called Imbricata pendula, in which the branches are reduced to this very narrow, thread like state. Really quite remarkable. It's a, a see through conifer, really attractive, veil and pendulous growth. Um, there's a little bit of reversion in that to a chair. I've now cut out, but it's a very pretty tree. I, I fear you probably can't grow it terribly well here, uh, but I love it. Uh, just a, one or two woody plants. This is a Philadelphus madrensis, I believe, from the uh, Madrid Mountains of Mexico. Mm -hmm. Very neat little square flowers, tiny, tiny foliage, half an inch long and, and a, a few millimeters wide, um, minuscule foliage. You don't know how 
plant can actually support itself with the uh, tiny leaves it has. And of course, a very good fragrance. And little, the flowers are hanging. I had to lie on my back with the camera pointing up to take that picture. But a charming and rather rare plant. And coming on to about this time of year, the berries here are a yellow berry in form of our native five bird opulus, the Gilda Rose. For some reason, the birds don't like these. They hang on the bush all through the winter. Even last winter, when the birds were absolutely ravenous in the cold, they weren't touched. With this little Clematis, Clematis brevicordata, a, a Chinese species. Now, with a relatively small garden, I'm pretty intolerant of plants. If they don't perform, they're not worth having, they usually go out. And this is one that is very close to going out. <laughs> <laughs> it isn't really worth its space. It's very vigorous, and it has these uh, little tufts of small and rather well, dull flowers in September. Uh, and it's only there because I haven't actually got round to getting it out yet. <laughs> but it'll, it's sort of all right, um, but it's, it's a B grade or C grade clematis. <laughs> I think there's no point growing plants that aren't worth their space. Right. You know, you can have a botanical collection or you can have a garden. Uh, you don't need to have everything. Here is a, a Hellenium uh, which was raised at the uh, company I used to work at in Holland, Sahin Seed Company. This is Sahin's early flowerer, which is widely regarded as one of the finest of the Helleniums for the border now. I, I had nothing to do with selecting this, but I, I feel a connection, and of course I like to grow a good plant like that. How tall? Oh, about um, four and a half feet. It's not, it's not a crazily tall one. It's a very useful plant. It's sterile, so it grows and flowering on and on for a long period from June till October, until the frost. And here's a, another daisy I like. We're now sort of towards this period of the year in the garden cycle. Chrysanthemum Dixter orange, selected by Christopher Lloyd and Fergus Garrett at Craig Dixter. People think I'm a sort of species man and you know, botanist and so on. They shouldn't like chrysanthemums and the like. This Dixter orange will be in one of my in my top ten garden plants. I think it's absolutely lovely. It flowers from August through to the frosts. A lovely, rich, rich orange flower. It's only about 18 inches in height has so many good qualities. It shows the, you know, what good plantsmen can do when selecting good plants. Uh, I really love that plant. And here's another good daisy for late in the season. A tender perennial, you have to take cuttings and keep them under glass, if possible. Argyranthum and Jamaica primrose, which just keeps flowering and flowering and flowering all through the autumn until the frosts will finally kill the plant. First class, we want these things with good long seasons where possible. Really helpful. So, uh, Argyre Anthem, Jamaica Primrose. And here is a, an Anthemis Tinctoria selected by a, a Gloucestershire nursery woman called Tinpenny Sparkler. That had flowered once this year. I cut it back, and this was the second flush towards the end of August. Really useful new introduction. And so important for people to be out there selecting all the time good garden plants. Uh, always a good thing to see a nursery doing. Well, I mentioned that earlier that we made a border this year where that terrace was along the, uh, along the garden, with horrible concrete slabs. We thought we'd make a nice border. We fancied peonies and delphiniums and such, uh, wanting good deep soil and so on. But we took the slabs up and found that that whole area had been used as dumping ground for all the rubble where the cottage renovations had been done a few years previously. So we thought, well, we'll never get this dug out, so we just added the topsoil on top and made a new border. Uh, that was it. We mulched it with our local gravel, Cotswold limestone gravel, so the pH is pretty shocking. Planted it out with newly propagated things in May, and that's it uh, about 10 days ago. Never believe people who say that gardens take a while to develop. Good plants, good soil, good conditions, and off they go and do really well. Just talk about a few things growing here. There's Agapanthus and so on in the front, Achilles and various daisies in the background. Another view of it from the other end. 
the bluish plant in the center is a nepeta, uh, catmint, nepeta azurea in this case, soft grayish blue, slightly sort of underwhelming in some ways, but actually rather charming as a soft plant amongst others. And this is interesting to me, it's a hardy plant from Ethiopia. Collected the seeds in Ethiopia in 2003, and it has proved to be absolutely reliably hardy in the garden ever since, minus 15 or not. So that's fun to be able to grow a plant from tropical Africa in the open garden unprotected. And here's a plant I'm fond of, I've been very impressed with, it's an Achillea, a yarrow, that's what's called pomegranate. I bought this from a nursery last year, I thought, that jolly nice, I like that, I think I've seen that before. And I've discovered that this series, which is known as the Tutti Frutti series, have been sold by Blooms of Bressingham. I looked on their website and found that they had actually come from Sahim, the company I worked for, and I had made the original selection. <laughs> um, so an old friend had reappeared after many years. But a lovely, really good red uh, Achillea, and I'm just hoping it's going to have good perenniality and hardiness uh, long term in the garden. Here's another selection I've made of uh, a good herbaceous plant. It's Iris, uh, uh, Sibirica Iris seedling. I don't know what the parents are. Uh, I call it scramble, as in eggs. Mm -hmm. And uh, a very pleasant bicolor, very free flowering iris. And one of our local nurserymen, Bob Brown from Cotswold Garden Flowers, um, who I may recommend if you wish to have a jolly good speaker for one of your meetings. Uh, he is paying me a small royalty for the sales of this plant and they are going to uh, support my um, student Emmanuel Saiko, a, a Maasai boy from uh, Kilimanjaro who I'm supporting through high, uh, high school in Tanzania. So the Iris is supporting uh, him. A couple of new introductions from Jim Archibald who was one of our great plant hunters and collectors who sadly died about 18 months ago maybe not even as much as that. Uh, very good orange poppy in this case. Look at those buds with the, with the silver hairs on them catching the sun. This is a, a rare Turkish species called Papava pautifoliatum. Uh, not as large a flower as the typical Papava orientale. Many more flowers per plant, I think, and a really handsome thing in May. So that's a nice introduction from Jim. And here is a fennel, ferula uh, species, we haven't identified them yet, also from the same collecting trip to Turkey about five or six years ago. Good foliage, really lovely frothy foliage, and then big fennel heads, but only about three and a half feet in height. Some of these ferulas can be 10 or 12 feet in height and a bit much. This one is a, a really attractive, low-growing species that I think is a, a, a splendid introduction. Well, the season moves on through the garden, of course, and coming into the autumn, as we are now, things are changing, of course, all the time. The grasses are over and standing up and looking good. Here's Lespedeza thunbergi in Gibraltar, which uh, I'm, came from a, a well-known nursery not far from here, <laughs> and is one of the great plants uh, that Tony has introduced uh, and has made its way into England. Uh, not enough, I think, in this case. A lovely autumnal scene there in the garden. And one of my favorite plants, and one of the last of the big perennials to flower of the year, is this red hot poker, Clipophia cornescens, and it's known as Oxford Blue because it was grown for many years in the Oxford Botanic Garden uh, and has those uh, very glaucous uh, rosettes of leaves, which are handsome and attractive all through the summer in their own right. And that will flower end of September, beginning of October, making a really powerful statement um, late in the season when most other herbaceous plants have really begun to fade away. And continuing the season, seed heads and fruits can often take on after the uh, flowers have faded. These are the uh, heads, seed heads of the Ligularia Britomerie Crawford, a big orange flowered one with dark purple foliage, just as attractive when the sun catches them in the right way as the flowers were a few weeks previously. 
plants giving interest throughout the year, I think, is what makes an interesting garden. And that is what happens and what we hope doesn't happen again in the winter. Thank you very much for listening. Do we have any questions for John? I was going to ask about your, uh, the jury's still out on some of these that you showed us. You used the term hardiness as uh, survival. What would you say in the long run what was going to be dropped out if you had a big guess at some of these that won't be around in five years? It's very difficult to say. I mean, the hardiness is for your own location. I can only talk about Hardy in our garden, in southwestern England. Um, I don't know. I find at Colesborn things have to be Hardy because they'd be dead otherwise. And I've tried a lot of plants there that would be Hardy in my parents' garden or in what I would call lowland England, i.e. not on the Cotswold Hills. Um, I have been killed in the first winter when we've only had uh, a few degrees of frost. So one lives and learns and, and develops a garden that way. I don't know what of that lot will be surviving in five years' time. I think most of what I've shown you, I regard as hardy. Even that in Patins Rothy from Ethiopia has survived our last winters, three hard winters in succession. And so I think that, for me, is proven to be hardy. Um, if it froze deeper and longer, uh, it might not be. But at the moment, it's fine. We live and learn, and that's the great fun of gardening. You never know what things will do. Some will do well, and some will disappear. <clears throat> it's only been on the rock garden since May, so we will see. Uh, it should be hard, cold hardy, but whether it will cope with our wet winters, wet grey winters, is more than like the question, I think. It's on a very well drained spot, it's very well baked in sun for the summer, but wet grey English winters it may not be to its liking, we'll see. Any more questions? You lock your chickens up at night? Yes, 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 <laughs> we do. Um, uh, they, they're allowed out when we're around, either at home or in the garden, where they are firmly locked up at night. They wouldn't be around for long. Though the, the Lady Amherst pheasant is loose and about, but he's got just enough wind to get up in a tree. <laughs> to to rest. Um, but yes, the hens have to be locked up. Um, we have foxes. Are you finding a difference in what seeds in in beds where you have a gravel mulch versus open soil? Yeah, it, it does cut down the um, weeds no end. Yeah, it's gravel. Yes, it cuts down the weeds and it also allows a, a nice seed bed for interesting plants to come in as well. You we've got to watch it eventually the weeds will, will get in, but um, it certainly smothers weed seed from below because all that topsoil we bought in was absolutely full of weed seed, as we found out where we hadn't mulched it. Um, but with two inches of mulch on the top, nothing came up from that. And um, it, it, is, it is quite a nice seed bed for other things. So you sort of balance it out. Hmm. Is anybody in the United States going to sell your iris scramble? I don't know. I don't know. I imagine Bob, will, um, uh, Bob Brown will, will try and find them an outlet for it over here. <laughs> do I use the Siberian grows do well around mm -hmm. here? Mm -hmm. no. mm -hmm. It's a nice one. <coughs> Any questions? Looks like it. So thank you very much, John. Thank you.